you're such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is a solved one about victims who were sold as human hamburgers. Now, this is a case that those with weak stomachs should skip out on. A story that is so disgusting in more ways than one. Information that can make you wonder if any of this is true at all. And victims who disappeared with one bite. I also want to thank our lovely sponsor, which is Magellan TV. And I talk about them all the time because I genuinely love this documentary streaming service. There are 3,000 different documentaries to choose from, and I feel like every single one I watch provides me with a new true crime case or new information that I've never heard of. One that I've been watching recently is called Women on Death Row. That is about five women who are obviously on death row, but their cases are all so different, and it makes you see them and their cases from a whole different perspective, which is why I like to watch true crime. But between all the different genres available on Magellan TV, you will seriously always be able to find something on there that you find interesting. So if you want to try them out, go ahead and click the link in the description to get a one month free trial or go to try.magellantv.com slash Brooke McKenna. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1996 in Maryland, and Rita Kemper was a 37-year-old woman living in Baltimore. She was actually a sex worker, but she did struggle with a drug addiction as well. Unfortunately, sometimes the two can be coupled together, but on December 8th, Rita would enter the police station with a horrible story to tell. She had just survived what she believed to be an attempt from a killer. Rita told investigators she had entered a trailer at the 3200th block of James Street near Washington Boulevard with one of her friends who lived there. She said this friend was a man that she had known for about a year and they did, you know, drugs together all of the time. And their relationship was always strictly friendship. There was nothing more and they were both fine with that, or so she thought. However, everything changed that day when Rita said that this man, this friend of hers, or who she thought to be her friend, struck her in the head twice and then tried to pull her pants down. At this point, Rita was alarmed. She tried to escape through the trailer door, and just as she got outside, she was drugged backwards and kind of choked as this man put her back inside the trailer. At this point, her pants were taken off her body, and her body filled with adrenaline and fear and she knew that she had to escape. So in a brief moment, she decided that she was going to get up, jump out the window, and run. The only problem was there was no way to get out. The gate was locked. But she did see a pile of pallets near the gate. There was a barbed wire fence, and she threw herself from those pallets over the barbed wire fence, cutting herself, but being able to escape. Rita had cuts all over her body, but she had just survived whatever this was going to be, possibly her own death. And Rita said that she was surprised that she even made it out alive because she said this person who she once thought to be her friend was telling her that she could scream as loud as she wanted, but he was going to kill her and bury her in the woods with the other bodies. Rita said that whatever that man planned to do that night, he could have done it if she didn't escape. He was that strong and that determined. She said that you could see the evil in him. He didn't plan on letting her go or letting her live. But she wasn't going to let him take her life without her putting up a fight. And that's exactly what she did. And her fight got her to a safe place, the police station. And now she was telling them everything she could about this man, but she only had a nickname for him, and that was the name Tiny. And so investigators had to figure out where this girl had just run from, as well as who the real identity was for Tiny. As investigators worked to uncover the real identity, another tip came in. This tip was from a man saying that his friend has just asked him to help him bury a body and that had, it had been a body he had killed a month prior of a girl named Kimberly Spicer. She was 23 years old and she had been missing the whole time. But instead of helping this man bury this body, this man decided to contact the police and let them know. As horrific as this was, it did lead investigators to be able to connect this to Rita Kemper's case and to find the true identity of this man, of her attacker and of a possible killer. And that was 41-year-old Joe Metheny. 
a week after Rita's attack at 1.40 a.m. in the morning, they went, the police and the FBI went to Joe Metheny's trailer and they arrested him. Now, investigators feared that he would put up a fight and he actually went with them willingly, which was very, very lucky for the police considering he was a 6'1", very large man weighing around 500 pounds and if he wanted to put up a fight, he probably would have been able to get away or at least make it very, very hard to bring him in. But he went willingly. They quickly realized that his name Tiny was supposed to be ironic because this man was anything but tiny. However, when they brought him in, they charged him with murder. He wasn't the only one arrested. You see, his trailer was on a plot of land that actually belonged to a company. And this is a company that he worked for. This is a company that sold pallets. It was called Stein and Son Company. And it was literally what Rita Kemper had used to get herself to safety was what they sold at this company. And it turned out that this entire plot of land was surrounded by these fences to keep people out and was locked. And Joe was the one who had the key. It was an eight foot high chain length fence with barbed wire at the top. And Joe was the only one to get the keys to this gate because he actually lived on the property at night when all of the other workers were at home. The owner of this company was Joseph E. Stein, who was 61 years old, and he was also arrested. He was actually picked up from a Christmas party and charged with an accessory after the fact for disposing of evidence. This since this was on his company's lot. At this point, Joe was already talking. The first thing he told investigators was that he was a very sick man. And he went on to confess to anything that they asked of him, but that didn't mean he was remorseful for it. Investigators believed that they were getting a statement about the murder of Kimberly Spicer, which is why they originally investigated him. However, they were about to get much more because this man began to happily tell them that he wasn't just a killer, he was a serial killer. Joe said that it had all started two years prior and he had a wife and a son at this point, a six-year-old son. It was 1994 and his wife, and him were both addicted to drugs at this point. But one day, Joe came home, everything was gone from the place that they were staying, and he realized his wife had taken his son and left him. He became outraged and he started checking every single home in the area, he was searching for them everywhere, and then he started to realize that his wife was probably under a bridge because that is where they would normally go to do their drugs and to sleep if they needed somewhere to sleep because most of the time they were homeless. So. He spent days looking for them and then he finally came across two homeless men and he believed he recognized them as being people who did drugs with his wife prior. This was at a tent city campsite which is basically like a temporary homeless facility where there's little tents set up for homeless to be able to sleep that's out of the sun. And so Joe came up to these two 33-year-old men named Randall Brewer and Randy Piker who were sleeping on mattresses in this area. And when the, he began to talk to them about his wife and they said they didn't know where she was, he became enraged. Joe then confessed to have killed both of them by hitting them over the head with an axe. Now there's not a lot about their murders. There are some sources that say that they were dismembered after this and thrown in a bush, and some say that they were left on the mattress, but either way, it was a pretty horrific sight and murder. And when these two men were discovered, there was actually another man who was convicted of another man's murder in this area. You see, at this time, there were groups of homeless men and they often like rivaled each other for places to stay, for things to eat, and just, they just hated each other. They butted heads. And so there was this man from this rival homeless group that was different than Randy and Randall's group. And he had been found with an ax that matched the murder weapon for Randall and Randy's murders. And he had killed another man named Everett Dowell. The killer's name was Larry Almost and he confessed to killing Everett, but not to Randall and Randy. He said he stole the ax from where they were sleeping because he saw that they were murdered and wanted to use it on Everett. 
but people did at this point believe that it was Larry who had also killed Randall and Randy because no one was suspecting Joe. But Larry was sentenced for only Everett's murder and given eight years, yet he only spent about a year and nine months in jail before he was let out. Investigators then didn't put too much effort into finding Randall and Randy's killers because there had been a whole bunch of threats between these rival homeless groups saying that people were going to kill everyone in the camp and unfortunately because they were homeless, not a lot of effort was put into caring about them or getting them justice. Then Joe said that Randall and Randy were not the only two he killed that night, that he killed multiple more. He said he continued to go on a rampage and he lured two different sex workers over to this same bridge, telling them that he was going to give them drugs and so they came and when they didn't tell him where his wife and son were either, he decided to kill them both as well. While he was doing this, he said that a fisherman saw him and he realized he needed to kill him as well. So he did so and he ended up putting these bodies in the local river and weighing them down so they would never resurface. Investigators thought that this was the worst of it. However, he wasn't done talking. Joe said that in July that same year, he met a 39-year-old named Kathy Ann Magaziner and she had brown hair. He described her as a little thin, a little tall. He believed he met her around July 3rd because it was around the 4th of July, but he didn't know the exact date. He also said she was about 5 to 6 to 5, 7 and 120 to 130 pounds. And she was also missing a couple of front teeth. She was also a sex worker and he had lured her back to his trailer this time. None of the other prior victims he had even taken back to his trailer. He just basically killed them on the spot. But Kathy, he took to his home. He said that they had sex while she was partially clothed and then he began to strangle her with his hands and then with an extension cord and proceeded to kill her. He said she was wearing cut-off jeans, white tennis shoes, socks, and a white pullover sweater. At the time, she also had a purse and he began to take all the clothes off of her as well as take her purse and then he hid her body in a shallow grave near his trailer in one spot and the, her clothing and her purse in another shallow grave elsewhere. Six months later though, he said that he dug Kathy's body up so she, he could decapitate her and take her skull, put it in a box, put it in the trash can and separate it from the body and then he obviously put the dirt back over the body so no one would find it. He was asked why he ended up killing Kathy and he said because he really didn't know. He said he had liked the sense of power, he got a rush out of it, a high out of it, and that he had no excuse other than he liked to do it. Then on November 11th of 1996, Kimber Spicer's mother reported her missing and Joe confessed that he had taken her home from the bar and then he stabbed her with a knife. He said that he buried her on the property as well. These weren't the only victims that Joe would go on about, but these were the only victims he had names and stories for. And we will go into the other victims here in a little bit, but for right now, I want to talk to you about the investigators and what happened when they began to try to connect Joe to the murders he had talked about. This was the fact that with the story of Randall and Randy, there was no evidence pointing to the fact that he was their actual killer. Nothing that could connect connect them and definitely nothing that could get him convicted. When it came to the other two sex workers he said he killed as well as the fishermen, of course their bodies were in the river, they were not found in the river, he did not know names or any way to identify them and so they couldn't really search missing persons reports to see who it could have been and a lot of the time unfortunately sex workers aren't reported missing so they were kind of at a dead end there too. On December 17th, Joe was actually taken out of where he was being held in jail and taken back to his trailer to point out where Kathy Magaziner's body was buried. Now, he actually was unable to find it at first, and so they had to go back a different day, and then he was about 10 feet off when he did point to it, but he was able to find it. They were able to find her body. They couldn't find the grave that she was put into, or the grave that her clothes were put into, though, even though he said that it was nearby his trailer as well. She was officially identified by dental records, and then her cause of death was determined to be asphyxiation, which matched what Joe said. Upon inspecting the trailer and the surrounding area, Kimber Spicer's body was found under the trailer, just like Joe said it would be, and further inside the trailer, furniture had actually been removed and it appeared as though blood stains were attempted to be cleaned, but they weren't cleaned 
thoroughly. But these weren't the only victims that Joe confessed to, like I said earlier. The problem was they could not find their bodies. There was about three to five or even possibly more sex workers who came in contact with Joe. However, why they couldn't find their bodies was the most disturbing part. You see, Joe Metheny was said to have an MO. He liked white sex workers who were addicted to drugs and were found to be easy targets for him where he could lure them based on the idea that they were getting drugs back to his home and then they couldn't escape him there. He would sexually assault them and then he would kill them in various different ways, but he stopped burying the bodies. He decided to switch things up and even more horrific than killing someone and burying them in your front yard was what he did next. Joe began to dismember his victims. He would then put them in different Tupperware containers in his freezer and store them there while he got rid of their bones and buried them elsewhere. With all of this new evidence he needed to do away with, even though he was a 500 pound man who did eat some of this, he began to open up a barbecue stand on the side of the road. And this is where truckers and, you know, just people passing by would go through town and they would grab a bite to eat because the sign said roast beef, pork sandwiches, but it was neither of those things that they were actually eating. Well, no, I take that back. Pork and beef were involved in these sandwiches, we'll say, but that wasn't all they were made of. And for weeks, Joe sold this meat to humans, innocent humans, that he was turning into cannibals. Joe said, I opened up a little open pit beef stand. I had real roast beef and pork sandwiches. They were very good. The human body tastes very similar to pork. If you mix it together, no one can tell the difference. He was right because no one complained. No one thought that there was anything wrong with these sandwiches and they couldn't have ever imagined what they were really eating. It's possible that it could have gone on this way for years with people eating human and not having any idea, with this man making cannibals out of his customers. But thankfully, Rita Kemper survived and she stopped it all. He claimed that he killed 10 people and that he didn't plan on stopping. However, those 10 people are still basically theorized because we don't have names and we don't have bodies. But how does a human get to this point? What brings them to this? And was he born like this or was he brought up like this? Well, Joseph Roy Metheny was born on March 2nd, 1955 to a normal family of five other children. Now, this is where the story begins to differ. You see, Joe was very adamant about his past and how it was one way. However, everybody who knew him in his past say that it was completely different than what Joe was saying. Joe told everyone who listened to him that he was neglected as a child. Basically, he had an alcoholic father who died when he was six years old in a car accident. And after that, his mother, who had six children, was working her butt off trying to make money and put food on the table. And he said that his mother never had time for him and he began to be sent to foster-like homes that were away from his family. And basically he was saying that these weren't foster homes, but these were like family and friends of his mother's where he would have to go and stay at. So he was never at home with the family. He said he dropped out of school when he was in eighth grade. And when he finally turned 18, he joined the army and he served in Vietnam and he didn't really connect with his family after that. Basically the way that everybody took it when he spoke was that his family was the reason for his killing and his anger and could be blamed for everything, that it was more of a nurture versus nature. However, when you spoke to Joe's mother, she had a completely different story. She said that, yes, when he was young, his father did die and she did have to go and get many different jobs to put food on the table and a roof over their heads. I mean, she was working as a waitress, a barmaid, a food truck driver, and she worked all the time, double shifts. And so, of course, she wasn't there all the time to be with him. However, she never sent him or any of the other kids to different homes to live at. She took pride in raising them and working hard for them and wouldn't want to send them away. She said that Joe was a good little boy who excelled in school and was so kind. But she also said that Joe didn't go to Vietnam with the army 
that he went to Germany, that he also got addicted to heroin there. And then when he came back, he did not want to contact anyone in the family. He didn't want anything to do with them. And she believed that it was such a sad story because the worst thing that had ever happened to him in her eyes was him being addicted to drugs. She was basically saying that they always tried to be part of his life and he didn't want that. Now, either way you look at it, I don't know, but there's a possibility that Joe could have just been born like this. And we'll get into a little bit more of his psyche here in a little bit. But Joe had moved on with his life at that point after getting out of the army wherever he had gone and came back from. He was living as a homeless man while he was working as a forklift driver where he would get about $7 an hour. I mean, it wasn't the most well-paid job, but he was getting paid. He was known to be well-mannered. He worked really well with his coworkers, but he didn't have anywhere to live because he continued to spend his money on drugs. It was this awful cycle. And so eventually his boss decided to give him the trailer that was on the property for his wife and son to live there with him. And so that's why, you know, he had the keys and he was well trusted to be there. People trusted him, but it turned out that was the last thing they should have done because Joe Metheny was using this as a place to kill, dismember, and store his victims. You see, Joe Metheny was believed to be a pathological liar. You know, instead of thinking about the truth first and having to come up with a lie, the lie was almost the first thing that would come to his head and out of his mouth. He would just lie automatically. It just came to him before he could even stop it, but he didn't even want to stop it because he didn't see it as a lie. Now, I can't be for certain that this is true, but it did seem to many people that his stories just didn't make sense. And so it was hard for many to believe that he was honest about his crimes either, especially when all of the evidence for the victims who were supposedly eaten through sandwiches was destroyed. I mean, they disappeared when that person ate them. And so there was no way to be sure that that even happened, especially because nobody got sick while eating at this stand. And there was, you know, no evidence of something being wrong with the sandwiches. I mean, it's the same way that nobody really knew if he ever threw three people in the river because they could never find them. It was just basically his word and people were supposed to believe it. I mean, they knew he was aggressive and willing to kill due to Rita's statement and due to the bodies found on his property, but they didn't know how sadistic he really was, if he would have really cut up bodies and fed them to people. These may be questions that we will never know the answers to if he was ever being truthful or if he wanted to make up these ludicrous stories. But another thing that he did lie about was the fact that his mother was dead. He told everybody that she was, and yet she was alive and well. Joe's attorney attempted to tell everybody that Joe was very remorseful for what he had done, that he blamed the drugs and alcohol for his change in personality that made him aggressive. And while he was being held in a psychiatric unit where he was, of course, weaned off the drugs, that he became more, you know, normal and less angry and was very upset about what he had done. His attorney said he was a completely different person. However, his statements showed no remorse because Joe said, the only thing I feel bad about in any of this is I didn't get to murder the two mother effers I was really after. And that's my ex old lady and the she got hooked up with. By 1997, a year after Rita's attack, Joe was brought to trial and sentenced to 50 years for her kidnapping and sexual assault. However, he was acquitted for her attempted murder. That wasn't all though. A year later, he was actually tried for Kimberly Spicer's murder and he was found guilty. He also pled guilty and he was sentenced to life. The same year, he went to trial for the murder and the robbing of Kathy Magaziner and he pled guilty once again. And because of the robbing being added to the charges, he was given a death sentence. He was also going to be tried for the murder of a 28-year-old woman named Tony Lynn Ingracia, which was another murder she, he was believed to be involved in. You see, her body was found on February 22nd of 1994, so kind of around the same time he was murdering in the same area and she had been stabbed and strangled to death. However, there was no evidence 
connecting him to her murder, so they couldn't charge him with it. She also fit the MO being a white sex worker. It was said though that Joe had wanted the death sentence. He said, the words, I'm sorry, will never come out for they would be a lie. I am more than willing to give up my life for what I have done, to have God judge me and send me to hell for eternity. However, that's not what he ended up getting because two years later in 2000, his death sentence for the Kathy Magaziner murder was overturned. The main fact as to why they gave him the death penalty was because they said that he robbed Kathy of her clothes and her purse when he separated them and buried them in separate locations. However, it was later found that it wasn't his motive to rob her and that the death sentence shouldn't have been given, so it was just pulled back to life. So Joe Metheny ended up going to the Western Correctional Institution and had his own jail cell and he was there for 17 years. But on August 5th of 2017, he was actually found unresponsive in his cell. A convicted Baltimore serial killer has died this weekend. Joe Metheny, the bald man in the video, was found dead in his cell. In this WJZ file video, Joe Metheny shows police where he buried the bodies. The 62-year-old was serving two life sentences without parole for kidnapping, sexual assault, and two counts of murder. And they were unable to resuscitate him, so that's where he died. He was 62 years old, and investigators did investigate how he died to make sure there was no foul play, and they didn't really ever come out with anything, so I'm assuming there wasn't, but nothing was ever said. But one of the last things Joe was believed to say was, so the next time you're riding down the road and you happen to see an open pit beef stand that you've never seen before, make sure you think about this story before you take a bite of that sandwich. But I think that that statement is so horrible. It's not just the fact that it makes me sick because there could have been people who didn't know that they were being turned into cannibals, but also what happened to these victims and that he kind of seemed to make it like this fictional, horrendous story that he was trying to make it as. Like he wanted to be some infamous killer like Ted Bundy and he tried to make this glamorous almost. like. I don't, I don't know how to describe it. He just really wanted to play it up. And that makes me wonder, especially that sense, if he really did say that, makes me wonder if he did make up that whole part about feeding people human meat and that he, you know, killed the women that were found. That whole other part was just because he wanted to seem more scary or a better serial killer, even though that's not even a thing. It should not ever be someone's thinking, but... Of course, someone who was already thinking like that could have been this deranged anyway. But I'm not telling you this story for him. I'm telling you this story for Kathy Magaziner, for Kimberly Spicer, for Tony and Gracias, for all of the other victims and sex workers that we may not know of, that we don't know their names of, who possibly died at the hands of Joe Metheny. That's why I'm telling you his story today, because it's not his story, it's theirs. And I hope that I got to take it back from him a little bit and I hope that you think of the victims more than him and you give them the spotlight and the respect and the love regardless of what they did for a living, regardless of addictions they had because they died at the hands of a monster. And so that's why we celebrate them today. That's why we respect them. That's why we want to look up to their strength, especially to Rita Kemper. We don't want to forget her because she really is one of the main reasons that he was caught and such a strong, badass woman who literally flung herself over an eight foot fence to survive. So I'm very sorry if I ruined your dinner tonight or any time that you're going to eat. I, I, you know, I'm grossed out too, but let's just pretend that that didn't actually happen, that he made all of that up so we don't have to think about it. Sound good? Okay. Well, don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay. Bye.